Okay, so this is chapter three, the Constitution video lecture. Um, the big idea for this chapter is the United States Constitution provides the framework for a strong system of government, a just system of government, and a resilient system of government. Um, and the essential questions that we're going to um, answer are, what does the U.S. Constitution reveal about the framers' belief when it comes to um, the role of the government and the people? How, is the re how resilient is the U.S. Constitution? contribute to the strength of the government that is created, and lastly, what factors have influenced how the U.S. Constitution is applied itself. So, this first objective, to answer that first essential question is, describe the structure and principles behind the Constitution. Well, the structure of the Constitution is in three parts. So, three parts to the Constitution. And the very first part of the Constitution is the preamble, or the introduction to the um, uh, Constitution itself. Um, and it's very short. It says to form a more perfect union, establish so a perfect union meaning perfect, the, wanting the the states to be united perfectly, which is you know a goal that will never be perfected, but it's a goal to you know a good goal to have. Establish justice, making sure everyone is treated fairly, uh, ensure domestic tranquility. Uh, domestic tranquility means peace amongst the the domestic people, the states themselves, that the states aren't fighting each other. So domestically peace, provide for the common defense, protect, so that's like national security, protect the United States from other countries and videos, and then promoting the general welfare, um, making sure people are taken care of, would be that, and secure the blessings of liberty. So this is the introduction, the first part of the Constitution, basically it sets the goal of what this government strives to do, to be perfect, just, peaceful, defensive, and take care of his people, and secure blessings and liberty as well. So, introduction, first part of the Constitution. Um, the second part of the Constitution is the seven articles. There are seven articles to the Constitution, and they all are very broad and cover a certain part of our government itself. So, Article 1, if you were to read Article 1 of the Constitution, it basically lays out um, the framework of the legislative branch of government. Um, creates that branch of government, and on Article 2, that's going to lay out the framework and creates the executive branch of government. That's where the president resides. He's in charge of, um, you know, and he's not just, you know, being the president is not just um, a one-man show. He's in charge of the executive um, cabinet departments. That's like your Department of Defense, Department of Secretary, or Department of State, Department of Homeland Security, um, and so forth. There's, there's many of those, and also all the agencies that our government has, um, the FDA, FAA, FCC, the CIA, FBI, um, all these are, these are all different agencies that are under this umbrella of the executive branch, and it, Article 2 is going to talk about all those different, um, where basically it just gives a framework of what, where the president resides, his powers, and whatnot. Article 3 is about the judicial branch of government, um, again, establishes the judicial branch of government and lays out what they can and cannot do. Article 4 um, is going to talk about how states can relate with each other. Um, how they, like, if they had a dispute amongst each other over something like water, how would, how would, that, how would that relationship, um, how would they deal with that conflict? So Article 4 is just how do states relate and, um, like, for instance, you know, does a state have to recognize your driver's license? They do, and that's because what's found in Article 4. You know, I have a Nevada license, it doesn't mean I can't drive in California because I have a Nevada license. They recognize um, my license in Nevada as mean I can drive in their state as well. So that's part of the relationship part among states. Article 5 talks about how you can amend the Constitution. Amend means to change or to add to. So we've added it to the Constitution 27 times, amended it 27 times, and Article 5 is going to talk about what that procedure looks like. Article 6 is the, is where you're going to find the supremacy clause of the Constitution, which basically says, there's defined right there, any law passed by Congress or treaties that are passed by Congress, there's supreme law of the land, meaning there's no law above it. Um, so Article 6 is just basically saying the Constitution itself and the laws passed by Congress, they are supreme law of land. There's no other land, no law above that land, that, those laws passed. And then lastly, Article 7 um, 
it talks about what, what they needed to do to ratify or to approve the Constitution. Remember, we just talked about the Articles of Confederation, how it wasn't that successful, and they wanted to change it. When they wrote the, the Constitution in Article 7, explains what are the steps needed to ratify or to pass the Constitution um, itself by the nine states or colonies at that time. So that's the second part of the Constitution. The third part are the amendments itself, all the additions um, that have been added to the Constitution. So this has happened 27 times, um, third part of the, the third part of the Constitution itself. So intro, the preamble, the second part is the articles, there's seven of them, and the third part is the amendments that has been changed or added to the Constitution 27 times. Um, now the principles behind the Constitution, there are six of them. The first one is popular sovereignty, meaning rule um, by the people. Um, basically the people, they establish a the government, not some king or dictator or something like that. The people themselves, they establish a the government and they are the source of its power. And um, I think that these days a lot of times people fail to remember or forget that they're the ones in control and they should they should be in control. They, should, they need to be aware of what's going on in their government because it is your government. So popular sovereignty meaning rule by people. Second principle behind the Constitution is federalism, the division of power between a national government and state government. Uh, this is this is very um, key to our government. This is how our whole system of government is set up. When we talked about different systems of government, the unitary system of government and confederate system of government, well, we have a federalism system of government where it's divided. Um, the right of states, they're protected. They have their own powers, and they're divided that power between the national government and the state government. So states have their own power, the national government has their own power. Third principle is separation of power. Um, each of the three branches of government that are created in the Constitution, they have their own set of responsibilities. The legislative branch is responsible for passing laws. The executive branch, their main responsibility is to make sure that the laws that are passed are enforced and followed. And the judicial branch of government's main responsibility is to interpret what those laws mean. Um, what does the Constitution mean, and how are they? How do they? How do the laws apply to the Constitution? So they're separated, and they have checks and balances, um, which is another principle. The fourth one here, um, meaning that one branch of government is not par more powerful than the other. They all can check each other's power in some form or fashion. Um, just for an example. Congress can pass a law, but the president can veto the law passed. Um, the president can, um, can uh, let's see, they may pass a law, but the, so Congress passes a law, the president signs it into law, and the judicial branch can actually review the law and say it's unconstitutional, so um, they, can, they can check the power of the two other branches of government by that. So each branch of government can control each other. Uh, number five is the ju judicial review, which is basically is the check. This is the con um, sorry. This is the judicial branch's check. This power to review anything that any law or action taken by the Congress or the President to be unconstitutional or not. Um, so, just for an example, a lot of states have already um, put into uh, put into the lower courts um, the health care law claiming that it's unconstitutional and eventually this this law that was passed by Congress a couple years ago is going to work its way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court is going to have to determine if that is that law constitutional and that's the power of judicial review. Laws passed or actions done by the President or Congress are they constitutional or not? And then um, and Marbury versus Madison is just an example of this um, principle so I don't really worry about it right now. Anyways, uh, the last principle is limited government. Um, government powers are restricted to protect individual rights. Um, our government doesn't have full blanche power over us. They can't do whatever they want. If you look at the first ten amendments, they're all restrictions on the government. They're all they're all saying the government can't do this, the government can't do this, the government can't do this, do this, this, because it's limited. And remember, we talked about these are these are some of the principles or ideas that our founding fathers came over to America with. This idea of having a limited government that's also a representative government. So that started way back in England. They 
our ancestors brought it over to America and the pilgrims and all that, and they made sure it was written to the Constitution when they were writing the Constitution that our government is limited in power. So that's breaking down. Of the, that's the breakdown of the Constitution and the principles behind it. Um, this next uh, objective, you say, is that um, summar summarize the powers and dues of the three branches of government. So we'll break. Basically, we're gonna break down the three branches of government. Um, now, the first branch of government, which you're gonna find in Article One, um, you're gonna find the powers that they have. Um, these are called express powers, meaning that they're expressly written in the Article 1 of the Constitution. You will find them. And then Section 8 of Article 1, they're called the enumerated powers, meaning they're numbered. They're numbered 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, they're basically just listed out for you. So they're enumerated powers. So the, these are the express enumerated powers of the legislative branch. They can levy taxes, raise taxes, they can borrow money, they can regulate commerce or trade amongst states and with other nations. Um, they have the power to make our money. They, if you counterfeit money, that's a federal offense. That's they have power to punish that. Um, piracy as well. Not that's not that's a big deal these days here in America, but back in the, when they wrote the Constitution, piracy was a problem. Um, they have the power to declare war. Many people think that the president can declare war. No, the president cannot declare war. It's written, it's expressly written in the Constitution. Only Congress can declare war. Um, they're the ones that actually raise and support the armed forces. When the president goes to war, he needs money to pay for that war. And Congress is the one that has to pay pass laws that pays for those um, adventures outside the United States. So to support, raise, and armed forces, that's all Congress's. Um, deal Navy as well, um, armed forces, um, so just m m militia. They can call them militia. We don't have militia today. We have National Guards, um, twelve organized militia. Same kind of thing. Uh, they have the power to 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 pass laws that decide what does it mean to become a naturalized citizen. What do you have to do? Like, do you have to live here for so many years? Do you got to take a test? Do you got to speak English? Um, so when it comes to the steps to becoming a naturalized citizen in the United States, meaning you weren't born here, you want to come to America, it becomes a, they pass laws determining how that works. Um, they have the power to, to establish post offices. Um, patents and copyrights, established courts is a big one. Once the Constitution was passed, um, the, the Congress quickly started creating lower courts, not just the Supreme Court, remember that's that's going to be in Section 3 of the Constitution. But they established all the, all the lower federal courts um, that we have today. They govern D.C. And lastly, um, 18th enumerated power is any law. They, can, they have the right to make any law in order to carry out the powers expressed. So the elastic clause is, is called the elastic clause because it kind of stretches their power. Meaning, just because... Oh, so, for example, health care, the health care law. If you look at this list here, nowhere does it say it has the power to nationalize health care. But it does have the power, number three, to regulate commerce, and commerce is trade, and trade includes um, health care, um, the trade of health care, meaning buying and selling of um, insurance and um, services provided by doctors. So, because of that, people who think the law is constitutional will say, well, the elastic clause gives the Congress the right to make laws um, in order to carry out the powers expressly written. So they have the power to, to regulate commerce, and Congress felt that they needed to regulate the health care business, so that's why they passed the health care law that we have that's coming into effect as we speak today. So it's not expressly written in the Constitution saying they have the power to do so, but due to the elastic clause, um, they're able to stretch out those powers. All right, so that's their powers. The their duty is basically to make laws. That's that's their job. They write laws and um, debate on them, and eventually vote on them in Congress. And they get passed. They're not a law until it's signed by. It's not a law until it's signed by Congress. But I'm sorry, it's signed by the president. But they're the ones that actually write. 
discuss and vote on the laws themselves. So that's their basic job, that's their duty. All right, the second branch of um, government we're going to talk about is the executive branch, which is found in Article 2 of the Constitution. Now, the president has um, vague powers. Um, if you look at Article 2, it says, if you were to read it, it would say the executive power shall be vested, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. So it's vague because what are what are the executive powers? This doesn't really explicit what those are. Um, and today, our our president has expanded upon what does that what does that mean when you look at executive orders, um, um, or executive um, yeah executive orders like the president can pass. Those are powers are explicitly in the Constitution, but because of its vagueness, um, they've been able to do things like that executive executive orders. Um, then there are ones that are actually specific that you can find in the Constitution itself. Um, one of them, one specific power is the commander-in-chief, meaning he is in charge of the military. Um, basically, he can he controls where the army goes and doesn't go, or where they, how, how long they're going to be out, and um, when they can come home. So being commander-in-chief, he's the head of the military, which, which is interesting is that the president of the United States is a, uh, doesn't have to be a military person in the first place. Um, we've had many presidents that are never in the military and they're the commander-in-chief, head of the military. So that's one specific power they have that you can find in the Constitution. Appoints the heads of their department. So the president has the power to appoint. Doesn't mean they're going to get in. They just get to appoint their heads of the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Homeland Security. They appoint those people and one of the checks of balances, a principle behind the Constitution is the Senate has to confirm them, these heads. So points heads, um, they pardon, or they can reduce someone's jail sentence. So pardon is basically get out of jail, or, or they can re reprieve or reduce your jail sentence. It has to be federal. It has to be a federal crime. If you have to be in jail for a federal reason, a federal penit um, penitentiary, um, the president can't pardon you if you broke a state or city law. They have the power to make treaties. But again, another check is a, these treaties that they make with the countries has to be ratified or agreed upon by the Senate as well. The Senate has to actually ratify them. Um, employee ambassadors, federal judges, and other top officials, again, all of these are powers they have that has to be approved by the Senate. And then um, give a State of the Union address. Every, every year, the president um, will call Congress, both, both chambers of Congress, into session and basically kind of give them an update of what of what they want to do where they want to go with the country like what what is the the pulse of the country at this time and where they may want to go what direction they want to do where they want to take the country um, so it's always a big deal it's also a good time for uh, the members of Congress to smooge with the president itself um, so save the address uh, another power is to call them back into a special session so say Congress is in, is on recess meaning they're not working, and the president wants them to come back to um, finish some business. Um, he can call them back into session. It's a power he has. It doesn't really happen too often, though. Um, meets with the heads of states, so heads of another, other countries, and then commissions all military officers. And lastly, make sure the laws are faithfully executed. And this really goes to um, the executive branches job their duty is basically to make sure that laws are being followed that um, whatever laws get passed they're being followed so that just goes to their duties protect liberty protect our property and businesses so all the laws that get passed is their executive's job to make sure that they are being protected oh and check congress powers as well can you don't want one branch to get too big so presence has that duty as well force laws all right i've already said that all right, the third branch of government, their powers, um, well, they don't, they, have, they don't really have power. They have jurisdiction, meaning that this is an area of which they can um, make rulings on, make a decision on. So they have jurisdiction or laws passed by Congress. This goes back to the principle of judicial review. Any law that's passed by Congress can be reviewed by the courts, federal courts, and determine 
their constitutionality or not. So that's part. Of, that's one of their jurisdiction treaties. Again, they can determine if a treaty is constitutional or not. Um, anything on the deal with the sea or water, um, that's their jurisdiction. We have courts that are just that deal with that only. Or yeah, um, bankruptcy cases are a federal issue. And lastly, and this is where the Supreme Court mainly comes into is they all they do is they look at the Constitution and looks at law and laws have been passed and determine if the law follows the interpretation of, of their interpretation of the Constitution itself. So these are all different jurisdictions which the federal government works under, the federal courts work under. Laws passed by Congress, treaties, um, anything that does with sea, bankruptcy, and interpretation of the Constitution. So they're basically their, their duty is to interpret what the federal law means. And does it apply or is it in line with the U.S. Constitution? So the first essential question you should be able to, after this, that section, you should be able to tell me what does the U.S. Constitution reveal about the framers' beliefs regarding the role of government and the people? All right, next objective, amending the Constitution, Section 3. Um, I'm going to itemize um, the different ways you can propose and then ratify the, um, the Constitution itself. All right, so the process, again, you can find this in Section 4. Sorry, Section 5. No, not Section. Article 5 of the Constitution talks about the amendment problem. Don't worry about those. That page is going to be incorrect. Um, but you can find you can find the actual steps on page in our new book. It's a new book on page 80, not 77. So page 80, you can find the actual um, steps. All right. So first thing, if you want to add to the Constitution, you got to have this idea and propose this idea to amending the Constitution itself. And there's two ways. You can do this, um, or two ways they can be proposed. Um, the first way is two thirds of both the Congresses, so both the Senate, two thirds of the Senate, and two thirds of the House representatives, um, two thirds of people agree to this proposal that you have to amend the Constitution itself. Um, and the second way is a constitutional convention called by Congress on petition of two-thirds of the 50 states. So if two-thirds of the 50 states petition Congress to have a special convention dealing with whatever this proposal the states want to have added to the Constitution, um, that's the other way you can propose amending the Constitution itself. Now the second step is to actually ratify, meaning um, adding it or agreeing or passing the amendment. That's what, that's what I'm trying to say, passing the amendment itself. So once Either the Congress or the petition of the states to Congress to, to propose this idea. Um, if you get the two-thirds vote there, then you have to get three-fourths of the states, the 50 states, to agree to the amendment itself. And there are amendments out there today that haven't gotten three-fourths of the states to approval yet. There you've gotten um, a couple or more, more than a couple, uh, maybe half of the states to agree to it, but not three-fourths of the states. And so, therefore, it's not ratified. It's just kind of just sitting there waiting for other states. And there's there's limitations on how long you can wait. But anyways, three-fourths of the states have to ratify it or three-fourths of a special con convention called by the 50 states can ratify, um, can ratify amendments itself. Now, um, the cool thing about changing the Constitution or amending the Constitution, it eventually ends up, it depends. It ends up in the, the hands of the states. The states eventually are the ones that have to decide if they want to make this amendment to the Constitution itself. So it's the people, again, it goes back to this principle of popular sovereignty. The people have the power. The states ultimately decide if they're going to be, if an amendment is going to be added to the Constitution or not. It could be introduced by members of Congress, but the states ultimately decide if it's going to be passed. Um, now, history. Um, all 27 amendments, they've both been proposed by two-thirds of Congress or Constitutional Convention, um, but they've only been ratified by three-fourths of, of the 50 states. There's never actually been a special convention called by the 50 states to ratify. I mean, that's something that's never been done, even though it's 
one of the steps to ratifying. It's just one of those steps that's never been actually done covered before. Um, so that's just a little interesting thing there. Um, so yeah, like I said, limitation, you have seven years to ratify. So amendments that get passed, if a state does, if three-fourths of states don't ratify within seven years, then the amendment just doesn't, and it just kind of dies. Um, okay, special uh here. Only amendment to go through a, to a special content convention was a 21st amendment. Oh, I'm sorry. The only thing, the only way, oh, the proposing amendment. So, constant convention called by Congress by petition of states, that's this, I'm sorry, under the proposing amendments, that's the one way that's never been done before. It's been ratified both ways, but it's never been proposed by a petition of the states. Um, now, and so the only time it's been amended by a special convention was um, the 21st, which was the prohibition, repealing of the prohibition. Uh, and also the 21st is the only one that repeals another. So these are just little tidbits. Um, if there was, if there's a convention, the states choose who their delegates are going to be at the convention, and how many go. That varies from state to state. So just some special instructions. Hmm. Anyways, don't worry about that. So here's a picture graph. Uh, proposing and ratifying the Constitution if the notes doesn't make sense maybe the this little picture thing does so again two ways you propose either by two-thirds of the members of the House of Senate or by a convention that was called by by a petition from the states so the states themselves and then ratification three-fourths of the state legislators have to agree or three-fourths of a ratifying convention um, takes place so those are the steps to proposing and ratifying the amendment to the Constitution itself. All right, this next objective here is um, classify the 27 amendments as either personal, criminal, voting, right, change of power, or structural change. You'll see on the side of these amendments, I'm going to have like a P for personal right, a C for criminal right, a V for voting right. Um, a C for change of powers and an S for structural change. That's just so you know the classifications of all 27 amendments. So I'm trying to go through this pretty fast because I don't think you really need, you don't necessarily need to know what all, um, what the 27 amendments are, but um, if you're able to identify if it's a personal criminal voting right, um, that's, um, that's important to know. All right, the first 10 are the Bill of Rights. These are the first original amendments to the Constitution. Again, this was a uh, part of the compromise between the Anti-Federalists and Federalists. Um, to pass the Constitution, there had to be Bill of Rights added to it, so they promised they would make amendments. There were 12 original proposals, but 10 of them actually passed. Um, and then today they're called the Bill of Rights. And again, this is part of another, the other principle of limited government. You're going to see these, the first 10 are all limits to the government. So. Freedom of religion, speech, assembly, press, and petition. The government can't suppress your religion, your, your speech, your assembly, your right to assemble, your, the press is right, and the right to petition government. There are exceptions to these, but anyways, these are all um, personal rights. Number two, the states, states maintain militia and bear arms, but that's a personal right. No quartering of troops, personal rights. Um, unreasonable search and seizure, personal rights. Number five, can't deprive someone of life, liberty, or property without due process, personal right. Speeding public trial, this would be a criminal right, because again, you're, if you're going to trial, it means that you've been charged with a crime, so this is a criminal right. Um, right to a jury, criminal right. Excess, can't have uh, excessive bells or cruel to public, criminal right. So you can see 6, 7, 8 are all criminal rights. And then 9, anything that's not in the Constitution is retained by the people, personal rights. And number 10, power not given to the federal governments or state governments is reserved for the states and the people. We're going to say this is a personal right slash structural change. Um, you know what? It can't be a structural change since it's original. When the original. So just personal rights. So those are your first 10 amendments to the Bill of Rights. Again, majority of these are personal rights. 6 through 7 8 are, are um, they're all personal rights except for 6 7 8. Those are criminal rights.
But again, these are all limits to the government. Um, they can't maintain a militia, um, or they can't take away your right to bear arms. They can't quarter troops in your home. They can't search your home unreasonably, um, and so forth. So you can see how that principle was applied in these amend amendments to the Constitution itself. All right, uh, amendment number eleven: States are immune from certain laws. As a structural change, they change the electoral college. Um, how the electoral college works, that's been that's a change, that's a structural change. Abolishing slavery is a personal right. Number 14, they define what citizenship is, expanded due process, and establish equal protection. What does that mean? That's personal right. Prohibited denying right to vote because of race. This is a voting right. This is basically is getting rid of um, trying to help the minorities in our country, specifically the slaves, um, trying to help them, give them rights when it comes to voting because there's poll taxes and stuff like that that limit, limit them to vote. So you couldn't deny someone the right to vote based on race, color, or being a slave itself. So abolish, so it gave voting rights to them. Um, 16, permitted passage of the income tax. So we're going to say this is a structural change of how they they tax people and also personal um, personal rights. It basically said you have to pay taxes. Seventeen the Senate elected by the direct vote prior to this amendment. Um, the Senate was not elected by the people. So this is a structural change of government and also a voting right given to the people to vote for the senators. Um, Eighteen prohibited alcohol, personal rights. Women suffering, suffrage, I mean, not suffering. Um, this is a voting right given to women. Suffrage meaning vote, the right to vote. Um, number 20, shorten the time between the president's election and the actual inauguration when they become president. There used to be a really long um, um, amount of time before the president actually came into office, and this uh, created a lame duck president, which uh, we still have today, but is, they were there's a much longer time the president, the former president was in power, which was a lame duck because they really didn't get much done because Congress knew that they weren't going to be in power much longer, so they shortened that time. So it's a structural change. Um, 18th Amendment repealed, I'm sorry, the 20th Amendment repealed the 18th Amendment, the prohibition of alcohol, um, personal rights. Number 22, limit the president's terms to two four-year terms, that's structural change. Given the resident, the citizens of D.C. the right to vote, for president this is a voting right, and banning poll taxes, another voting right. Determining how a president, what happens if a president dies, what's this, the order of succession? It's a structural change. Twenty-six amendment, the right to vote, lowering the right to age to vote to eighteen, voting right, and then the last one, twenty-seventh amendment, Congress members' salaries don't increase until the next election. This is so they can't get a raise while they're and they had to get basically they had to get voted back into office if they want to get the raise that they pass. All right, so those are the amendments, and that section should help you answer this question: How has the resiliency of the U.S. Constitution contributed to the strength of the government it created? All right, um, the last section here is applying the Constitution, Section Five. Um, there's a couple objectives in this one: How have the three branches of government? How has how have the government three branches of government applied to the Constitution? Um, well, the three branches are first one is the legislative branch. Um, now, the legislative branch, the way it has applied the Constitution is um, by expanding the justice system. Um, it has the power, again, the power to create lower courts, and they did just that by expanding the justice system by adding. Um, courts to our judicial or federal judicial system that we have today. Um, another um, way the, the legislative branch has, expand, has applied the Constitution, the powers are given to the Constitution that they have, how they applied it, is by creating the executive departments and agencies themselves. So the president is in charge of them, but Congress has the power to create them. Um, the most recent one is Homeland Security. President Bush felt that that was necessary to have a department just for that alone to protect us, and Congress created that department itself. So they've expand; they are applying their power um, given to them by the Constitution. 
and then expanding the law into new areas. Um, you know, when the Constitution was first uh, written, you didn't have the Internet. Um, so there are areas in which the Constitution is silent about, and these new technologies that we have with computers and cell phones, um, these are, this is given the reason uh, for the Congress to um, pass laws that are maybe not necessarily talked about or even mentioned or even applied in the Constitution itself. So, so again, that's all up to that, and all, that all determines what the Supreme Court believes of how they interpret the Constitution. So, so expanding new law into new areas. The second um, branch, the executive branch, how they've applied the Constitution is um, they apply the law through executive agreements. So an ag executive agreement is an ar arrangement or a compact with foreign leaders or, or governments. Um, that, is, that power is nowhere found in the Constitution. Again, but again, like I talked about earlier, it says the power, the, the, there are powers that give the president that are very vague, and this is an example of the executive agreements. Um, they, uh, um, they've kind of inherited this executive power um, as the commander in chief and so forth. Um, executive agreements are important in conducting foreign policy. Um, they've increased, presidents have done this more and more often. Uh, the executive agreement power, especially when they're asking to, they're trying to bypass the long and clump, complex process of going through Congress. It's a quicker way to um, get things done is by passing executive agreements and not having to go through through um, the Senate's approval, wait for the Senate's approval. So executive agreements, compacts with foreign leaders or countries itself, even though it's nowhere in the Constitution, that's applied. That's, how, that's an example of how they applied it. Um, agencies adopting rules to implement laws. So when laws get passed, they're very vague, first off, and um, it's up to these agencies to implement these laws, make sure that they're being followed and enforced. And then the last judicial or last branch of government is a, is a judicial branch, and um, the way they apply the Constitution is the principle of judicial review. Um, basically, they, they review any law or action done by president or Congress and determine if it's constitutional or not, and that's, that's all determined about how those nine members of the Supreme Court interpret the law. So that's kind of on them. And then second objective here, how have political parties, customs, and traditions changed how the Constitution is applied? Um, now, all of these parties, customs, traditions, they're, they're no longer, they're not in the Constitution. You're not going to find any of these terms or words in the Constitution. So they're informal meaning that they don't actually, they're not in the Constitution, but they actually do have an impact in how we interpret the Constitution. So political parties, um, by having political parties, they are the ones that determine who we're going to vote for, and these people that we vote for are then going to pass policies that may or may not go along with the Constitution, and also programs that go along with that. So, and those programs are going to be, and in, in policies, they're going to be presented to you, the people, and we're going to either agree or disagree with them. So parties informally help determine what the Constitution means by putting people, by voting people into office who then determine, like, who the Supreme Court justice members are going to be. And so in a roundabout way, political parties have an informal impact on the interpretation of, of the Constitution itself. Um, customs have become part of our government as well. Um, they're, no, they're not mentioned again. They're not mentioned in there. However, um, for example here, the Constitution has authorized the president to require the opinion and writing of the principal officer of each of the executive departments. Um, so because of this language you find in the Constitution, presidents nowadays rely um, on their... Or they've So the president, George Washington, created the first cabinet, which is nowhere in the Constitution. There's not a, it doesn't say the president has the power to create a cabinet. So this custom has become part of our government, just having cabinet members, and that has been expanding throughout our history, the, 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 the number of cabinets, departments that we have. And then the last one here, traditions. Some of the traditions we have have become law, and the, probably the, the, best, the best example of this is um, President Washington, again, only staying in office for four years and then getting out. This uh, tradition that he started became law after um, Roosevelt decided to uh, 
keep on running over and over again and successfully winning. So, you know, he, people want him in there. But anyways, that tradition has become a law. Four years in office, um, and then you need to get reelected. And, but you know, and there's an amendment now that has limited your term, so two, four-year um, two four-year terms into office of presidency. So, again, traditions. So, this last essential question, what factors have influenced how the U.S. Constitution applied? But you should be able to answer that after um, that portion of notes there. Um, again, here's all three of them. At the end of this uh, chapter, you should be able to answer all three of these essential questions and know everything, um, know the ins and outs of all, how that all works there. And that is it for Chapter 3, The Constitution.